Revelation chapter 20. When people think of Revelation, this is actually probably the chapter they think about. This is the final battle, largest battle, the defeat of Satan, being thrown into hell forever and ever. And also the great white throne of judgment where everyone who uh, will stand before God's judgment seat and those whose work name was not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. There's a lot to talk about in this chapter. Alright, so there's a lot to talk about here. So, one thing I want you to remember is that he talks about the great white throne judgment. Alright, so let's take a look at the great white throne judgment. Alright, so in Revelation 20, verse 11... And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. All right, obviously this is Jesus. He's the one that sits on the great white throne. And this is obviously Judgment Day. All right, so what happens at Judgment Day? Well, I, I, I do this all the time because I want to make this real simple and real clear. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's Judgment Day. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is Judgment Day. I don't know what you could possibly think this is. It's mind-boggling to me. To suggest this is not Judgment Day. We're separated from the unsaved when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's that's the judgment of God. There is no other judgment. It's mind boggling to suggest that it's not Judgment Day. You know, what in the world are you thinking when you suggest it's not Judgment Day? Because this is taught from Genesis to Revelation, all throughout the Bible, the judgment of God. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt, to shame and everlasting contempt. So, first the dead in Christ shall rise. I mean, this is parallel. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the judgment of God. Separation of the saved from the unsaved. I mean, it's a just mind-boggling. So let's go to Genesis 3, where it all begins. All right. So the serpent deceived Eve, beguiled her, and because the serpent did this, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, in between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This It's so simple. The reason why this happened is because Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and 
evil because Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they knew good and evil and God put this on the serpent with the prophecy that her seed which is Jesus Jesus Christ it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel thereby putting an end to evil forever this is the judgment of good and evil now uh, it's like people that teach this idea that there's that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's not the end of the world it's not judgment it's, it's it as though they have no understanding whatsoever none first of all Romans 3 verse 10 <clears throat> excuse me as it is written there is none righteous no not one you're not righteous so when God makes this judgment of good and evil how is he gonna find you good well it's only by the blood of Jesus that we are made pure because he is pure if he doesn't make us pure then he's not really pure himself but he is so pure that he makes us pure all right so that's the judgment of God that's the judgment of God All right, so let's consider this. Matthew 9, go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. There is none righteous. If you think you're righteous, Jesus is not for you. Think about that. But if you know that you're a sinner, and you are, then Jesus has come for you to have mercy on you and to give you eternal life. There's no way for you to offer your life as a sacrifice. There's no way for you to be righteous. Only through Jesus Christ, the righteous. Not by your works, but by his works are you made whole all right and that's pretty simple basic stuff man pretty simple pretty easy to understand really unless your eyes are closed and the veil is upon your heart then you can't see it all right so the question is the great white throne is that another judgment no there's one judgment there's one resurrection there's one rapture there's one end of the world now think about this if it's the end of the world when jesus comes can there be another end of the world if there's another end of the world after jesus comes then the first end of the world was not the end of the world. 
Does that make sense? It seems very basic. 95% of the pastors today don't comprehend simple logic. It's amazing. Why is that? Well, I think, in my opinion, I guess, the reason is because they don't trust the Bible they hold in their hands. Rather, they put their trust in what men say God said. <laughs> Think about Genesis 3. The, God came to Adam and Eve and commanded that they eat not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the servant comes along and says, Yeah, has God said? Getting Eve to doubt the word of God. So rather than trusting God, they trust the serpent who says what God says, All right. which is contrary to what God says. So rather than trusting God, the woman trusts the serpent. And people are doing that today. Rather than trusting the Word of God, men are trusting in other men to tell them what God says. All right. Now, surely I can't be the only one that sees this. Second Corinthians 11, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, this man up here is John MacArthur. Are you going to trust what he says? Or are you going to trust what the Bible says? All right. So I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, there's not a judgment day and then another judgment day when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It is the end of the world. So I showed you here in 1 Thessalonians 4 when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are resurrected some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the end of the world. You can't have this happening when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and then have another judgment. It's nonsensical. It, it, it's void of rational thought. It really is. And it's astonishing that anybody would even entertain the idea. But again, 99% of all the preachers today teach this because they don't trust the Bible they hold in their hands they trust what other men say God says in other words they're putting their trust in the serpent now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made but I fear Lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Alright. 
Okay, and what can I say? Nobody listens to me, but what can I say that might help you to see that the Word of God is true and that these men are liars just because they wear a fancy suit, just because they have lots of money, don't mean they're smarter than you. I guarantee it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now you can understand that perhaps when you consider that word, the simple, that means dummies like me, okay? I'm not wise, but the Bible is from God, because the Bible is from God. It makes me wise. Otherwise, I'm just a big dummy. Alright. These men. They appear to be smart. But they lack understanding. It's amazing. It's amazing. It really is. You can be regarded as the smartest man on the planet and not know what the H-E double hockey sticks you're talking about. That's true. Let God be true, every man a liar. But when it comes down to it, at the end of this world, the Bible's going to be proven true and men are going to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're liars guarantee it guarantee it so it's interesting to me this gentleman here talks about the binding of Satan and here we got a gentleman again talking about the binding of Satan all within a day of one another. So let's finish this by talking about the binding of Satan. All right. Right, Revelation 20, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottom, spent a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottom of the pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Alright, so I'm going to take a different approach, I guess, today. Let's just go to let's go to Mark three. Let me find that here. I want to see if I can. Oh my goodness sakes! All right. And if Satan rise up against Satan, 
And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Okay, so let's start right here. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. All right, so let's let's compare that with what we read here. Oh, let me do this. There we go. Okay. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him. All right. You see, you see a parallel right there. So Jesus Christ has come into this world and he is bound, binded, Satan. Of course, Satan is the spirit absent of God. Okay, make no mistake about that. Now, in the Old Testament, There was one nation of God. Outside of that nation were nations deceived. All right, one country, one group of people inside borders. They were the children of God all right in the kingdom of God was with the children of God make sense all right that I mean that's really important to understand that <laughs> it's really important I mean look you've got what what is it uh, 39 books in the Old Testament all essentially testifying to that fact you had one group of people outside of that group of people were not the children of God they were deceived by Satan Matthew 21, Jesus says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So in the Old Testament, there was one group of people. All right. So now here comes Jesus, and he binds the strong man, All right, which is Satan. All right. So now Satan no longer has an entire group of people to himself like he did in the Old Testament. Now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, so we're no longer isolated into one region of the world now the kingdom of God is available all over the world and of course we are taught to preach the gospel to every creature go out go out go ye into all the world that's why Jesus says go ye into all the world Things are different now. Things are different now than what they were before baby Jesus was born. Make no mistake about it. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. 
in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. All right. I mean, that's why Jesus says this. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. It's different than what it was in the Old Testament. Different. So now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in him. All right, so let's fast forward to the end of the thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Why? Why? Why is that? Well, consider. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so there's that separation again. In the Old Testament, there was that separation, but they were on the earth. Now, at the end of the world, we are up in the air. We're separated. All right, I talked about that yesterday, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The harvest is the end of the world. The wheat are the saved, the tares are the unsaved. So we are lifted up in the air. The unsaved are at our feet. Right? So the unsaved are at our feet. And when there's this separation now Satan once again has all the, these people all these nations to himself just like he did in the Old Testament and shall go out to deceive the nations just like the Old Testament which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog it's a reference to Ezekiel 38 Right? That was um, essentially a foreshadowing of the end of the world. Um, that's why there's that symbolic uh, gesture or that symbolic parallel, if you will. Right? To gather them together to battle. So Satan goes out to deceive the nations because all the people. Look, when this happens, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and we are lifted up in the air. The only people on earth will be unsaved people. Destined for destruction. And there's nothing they can do about it. And so Satan gathers them together. Now, <laughs> what happens? We're up in the air. They're at our feet. And they went up on the breath of the earth and camp the, camp, the camp of the saints about. Where's the camp of the saints? We're up in the air. We're not on the earth. If we're on the earth and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them, it would, they, God would get us too. God's not going to do that to us. He's going to lift us up. He told us he would. I mean, I just showed you. Right? This is all throughout the Bible. On Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. The angels shall gather together his elect. Right? In Revelation 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them to come in worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. You see? We're up in the air. And our enemy is at our feet. Right? You see that? That's pretty simple stuff. I mean, this is all throughout the Bible. 
I'm going to try to make this easy for you to see. First Corinthians 15. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. See, when he comes, we are up in the air and our enemy is at our feet. See, we're up in the air. The saints are up in the air. And our enemy is at our feet. Now, this thing is taught all throughout the Bible. It's amazing. All throughout the Bible. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. It's, it's amazing, really. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, we're up in the air with the Lord, right? We're up in the air with the Lord, right? We're up in the air with the Lord and our enemies gathered at our feet remember what it said in Genesis 3 I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head the serpent's head and thou shalt bruise his heel the Lord's heel he's going to stomp his foot we're up in the air our enemy is at our feet and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is the judgment of God. It doesn't make any sense to teach anything different than the simple truth, uh, the simple scripture. I mean, it could not be easier to understand. But men do not want to understand the simplicity of the Bible. They would rather put their trust in men. John 3, and this is the condemnation, however you say that word, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men would rather trust what other men say than the simple truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and the written word of God.